Isabel is right. Science needs storytellers. But social scientists make bad storytellers. But I'll try today to tell you a story. A story about what the national movement in India thought about science. I'll tell you the same story twice. Once, by how the national movement actually looked at science. And two, by a group of alternative scientists who tried to deconstruct a different possibility for science. Actually, when you read the history of science and the history of nationalism in India, you're struck by one thing. We weren't seeking to overthrow the British. We wanted to rescue them. We wanted to rescue them from the modernity that we felt in a deep and fundamental way the real goal of Indian science was to rescue modernity. In fact, if you look at the goals of the first scientific laboratory we created, the Indian Association for the Cultivation of Science, the first goal is to rescue science from Western civilization. There's a confidence, but there's also a playfulness and a humor. You know, it's not caught in Gandhi's statement. When a journalist asked him, what do you think of Western civilization? He said, it would be a good idea. <laughs> it's a possibility. It's an experimental possibility. But for that, you have to look around and not just look at it. And I think in this context that I want to begin by saying, if you look at the Indian national movement, it was a very strange movement. It was not really interested in throwing the British out. If you look at the debate from science, it was an attempt to create an availability of eccentricity. I can't think of the amount of eccentric people who participated in the Indian national movement. It was probably the most hospitable of movements, especially when it comes to the kind of scientists who participated in it. Alan Octavian Hume, who was called the father of the Indian National Congress, was actually 19th century's greatest ornithologist. Patrick Geddes, the Scottish biologist, was actually one of the great town planners. All of them participated in the movement. They gave it a plurality. And in fact, if you look at the goal of the national movement, it's an attempt to bring back plurality. There was a particular relation between knowledge and democracy which science wanted to bring about. And if you look at the nationalist archives, the favorite British scientist of the Indian national movement is Alfred Wallace. Wallace wrote a wonderful book called The 19th Century. The wonderful century. And in fact, he goes far about Kuhn, Thomas Kuhn in that, where he says, a science at its moment of victory or dominance should invent alternatives so it doesn't lose its creativity. <laughs> the dream of plurality, I think, was one of the things that haunted the Indian national If you, in fact, look at almost all the scientists who participated in it, take the theosophists. Theosophy is dumped today as a kind of eccentric, critical, hollow idea of quackery. But the scientists who participated in it tried to actually rescue materialist science from a certain kind of madness. India was fascinated by the Theosophist movement. In fact, the Theosophist movement begins the inauguration of both nationalism and the critique of science in India. We love the other West. In fact, I think if you talk about the Indian national movement, it was an attempt to rescue the performativity of science from the dominant hegemonic models. And I think that was really fascinating. But there was a sadness to this movement, a movement which dreamt of rescuing science from its positivity, from its modernity, unfortunately got caught in two of the greatest genocides in history. The Indian national movement was a peaceful one. The Indian nation state was constructed on the basis of two of the greatest genocides of history. The Bengal famine, where the British eliminated 3.5 million people and got away with it. There was no Nuremberg trial for Winston Churchill. In fact, you read the historians, Indian historians, they don't treat them like a Bully Boy Scout and partition, which eliminated 1.6 million people. Two genocides in history which India, the Indian national movement had to go through. And how did it become a nation state? It became a nation state by sublimating itself through science. 
We created the structures of planning. We created the idea of urban planning, of centralized control, all of it. In fact, we felt an independent India would be a planned state based on the scientific method. This dream of the scientific method, of course, met its greatest values in democratic India. India dreamt of, uh, Jawaharlal Nehru, in fact, dreamt that India would be, uh, the dams and laboratories would be the temples of modern India. India produced more than refugees from dams than from all the wars we have fought. We have eliminated, in fact, displaced 60 million people. 60 million refugees from dams, from a model of energy, from an idea of science which was positivist. What I want to do today is something very simple. In the 1960s, one of our greatest scientists, trained at MIT and at Carnegie Mellon, who was the first dean of IIT Kanpur, walks out to work in a slum, where he says, it's time to rescue science from its aridity. We need a democratic science. That means we need a science which caters to the public, which dreams of the public, which talks to the public, but which at the same time looks around at the creativity of ordinary people. C.V. Sashanti, in fact, dreamt of a very strange word. He said, the danger of Indian science is that it's aridly boring and imitative. And the danger of Indian democracy is it has become narrowly electoral. Can we, by reworking science as a thought experiment, revitalize democracy and reactivate science? The goal was very simple. He took, built two little laboratories in a slum in Chennai, and he said, I'm going to carry out a series of thought experiments which I want to dream an alternative science. And the first thing he said was, let's look at, at, in fact, one of the most interesting critiques made of the Indian National Movement was by Patrick Gibbs, who said the Indian National Movement was invented before it understood the laws of thermodynamics. And this Seshadri begins with the story where he reads me a chapter from Harold Morowitz, the Yale biologist, who was once asked, what is the greatest document America produced? And he says, the American Constitution. Then he asked him, what is the second greatest document America produced? And Morbid says the Gibbs equation for thermodynamics. And then Seshanti asked the question, what if about 10 scientists were sitting in the constituent assembly? Would science have been different? Would our dreams of method and our ideas of progress have been stunningly different? If say, Morbid, Gibbs, Seshanti all sat in the constituent assembly, dreaming of a future India based on science. And it's in this context that he began by saying, I don't think we understand citizenship in India today. Citizenship is not about residential status. Citizenship is not about identity and identification. A citizen is a person of knowledge. And one of the first things citizenship means is the right to different forms of knowledge. That is, you've got to be able to find the relation between knowledge and democracy in new and fascinating ways. And using me as a social scientist, he said, discover a set of concepts which will let us work more constitutionally. It's at that time when I was working in Gujarat, a group of tribals came to me and they said, oh, you work on something called science? I said, yes. Can you help us? I said, yes, what do you want? He said, no, we want to have a seminar. He said, we want to have a science seminar between our tribal science and your Western science. But we want it to be at the same cognitive level. We want parity, we want equality, we want plurality, we want dialogue and conversation. Can you invent a concept for this? That's how we invented the idea of cognitive justice. The right of different forms of knowledges to survive if they cater to the life and livelihood of people. Cognitive justice, in fact, became central to the dream of alternative science. It also became a different way of defining knowledge. If I remember, if we look at the great social movements in science, the whole notion of accountability is very different. It goes back to the Gandhian idea. It's no longer a question of accounting. It's no longer just accountability. It's an idea of responsibility. 
which means connectivity to the other parts of the universe. The neighborhood has to be a part of the cosmos. And eventually, trusteeship. If they are defeated groups, defeated knowledges, defeated societies, you must try to own up to them. In fact, it's in this context that the Indian National Movement fought possibly the most interesting battle against the museum. Anand Kumaraswamy, in fact, said, the museum smelt of death and for Matihari. He quotes the Sinhalese journalist to say, if God were to return today and ask civilized Western man where the Aztecs, Incas, and Australian Aborigines were, would he take him to a museum? What he wanted to challenge was a certain notion here where it says, can we make science constitutional? The thought experiment I'm going to perform today is, what if 10 scientists with a certain kind of awareness that Isabel talks about were to create a new constitution? The first idea would be the notion of cognitive justice. The second idea would be the idea of citizenship as responsibility for the forms of knowledge that you're concerned with. But thirdly, there's the question of responsibility and the language of responsibility. This was brought home to me very recently when I was working in the regions of uh, Orissa where a waterfall died. And I remember the tribal coming to us and saying, a waterfall died today. So I said, what? He said, a dream died today, a myth died today, a sense of the sacred died today because a waterfall died today. I remember talking to a leading economist who said, so what? It's so many cusacs of water. This question of how we look at nature, what Seishadri calls the re-enchantment of nature required for a new constitution, I think becomes very important. Because I think what we are looking at is the possibility of a narrow science becoming a source of tremendous violence without being able to point the finger at any one particular scientist. There's a kind of penalization of responsibility in the way we conduct science today. Can we revive a new ethical model, model for science, which is dialogic, which is plural, which is open to experimentation in both ethics and science. And it's in this context that all of us began with the idea. It's very new, it's still being tried. It in fact emerged from the debates on biotechnology. When the debates in biotechnology took place in India, the environment minister in fact summoned the Indian Academy of Science to write a report on biotechnology. In the simultaneously, the social movements went about creating a critique of genetics. It was fascinating, that meeting. It was like, it's like, it's like a, a commons meeting to decide the fate of science. You had farmers, you had uh, ordinary workers, you had peasants, you had women, all of them talking science and talking science brilliantly. The language was different. And it's in this context that Seishasi first said, one of the things democracy needs is the idea of epistemic <coughs> brokerage. You need someone to translate different dialects of science within a particular kind of congress, between a kind of particular kind of meeting. And it's here that we are now working out the idea of knowledge panchayats. <coughs> when you discuss the future of any technology, it can be genetics, it can be nuclear energy, you summon all the people who are stakeholders, who dream of possibility of a certain kind of science, bring them to a meeting like this. Listen to the voices, translate the voices, mediate the voices, think of new consequences, think of new anxiety. I remember we had a similar kind of meeting for nuclear energy, where the biggest objectors to the nuclear plant at Kodokonam were housewives. The language they spoke was completely colloquial. They talk about a certain kind of smell. They talk about a certain kind of uh, pain. They talk about certain kinds of anxieties. But what one of my friends, what the scientist did was, he put all these complaints, what he calls the sensorium of knowledge, and he produced scientific equivalence for them. There's a possibility of translation. There's a possibility of equivalence. And it's this dialogue between science and other forms of knowledge which I think becomes essential for democracy. We need a new language for it, we need a new set of attitudes for it. But I think the price India would pay otherwise is, we'll eliminate the tribe. The tribe is not 
not a marginal entity in India. It covers millions of people. And the diversity of knowledge required for it, in fact, becomes the first critique of the Indian idea of Western enlightenment. Let's take the triangle. Liberty, equality, fraternity. The West has paid too much attention to liberty and equality and too little to fraternity, too little to plurality, even less to diversity. So what we're now trying to say is we need an enlightenment which would allow for plurality. This idea of the French Revolution clashes with the goals of the Industrial Revolution, growth, rationality, productivity. When these two clash, you cut the current problem today of sustainability, plurality, and justice. What Seshadri says is, it's not enough for science to work in the laboratory. We don't abandon epistemology, but you give it a wider notion. Where epistemology is not just verification in the laboratory, but verification in the contextual world that the idea has to follow. So you have life, life systems, life cycles, livelihood, and lifestyle. You have to look at genetic engineering or nuclear energy in terms of these wider epistemologies of democracy. A mere analysis of political economy is not enough. To me, what is really interesting is that Indian democracy, while it produces the facade of electoralism, in its dissenting imaginations, produces one of the most pluralistic ideas of science and technology. Inventive, plural, and playful. I think one has to realize this. Throughout, there is no hostility to the West. There is no hostility to the democratic model. In fact, I remember the poet A.K. Ramanujan once said, Indians don't believe in the center-periphery model. It's too distancing. He said, my idea of discussing something with the other, or dialoguing with the other, is the difference between the front yard and the back yard. He said, in my colonial house, the front yard was male, masculine, positivist, scientific. The backyard belonged to the woman. It was the place of storytelling. It was the place for questions. But between front yard and back yard, we can domesticate the idea. Using this idea, in fact, India has tried to domesticate the West. I don't think we're interested in conquering the West. It's too boring. It's the question of how to domesticate and translate the West in a way that the West can participate in the way dreams we're talking about. Our dreams of democracy as it dealt with science were very different. And I think we went to push it further. Because one of the things we're now talking about is can we think of a new social contract where nature becomes part of the constitution? Nature not as natural resources, but nature has been represented in the constitution in a way. <coughs> Recently we had fascinating debates on the Ganges. Of course the government innately told that the Ganges is the Hindu river, therefore it's sacred. And then it gave it a record of representation you get from a public works department. But one of India's greatest engineers, D.P. Agarwal, went on a fast to talk about the revitalization of the Ganges of the river. He said, the Ganges can bring back the sacred to science, can bring about a re-enchantment of nature. Of course, the government ignored it. Ten days ago, he died on the 107th day of his past. But there was an attempt to bring Gandhian ideas of non-violence, scientific ideas of creativity, together into a new ecology of knowledge. To me, that is the fascinating part. It's still marginal, it's still dissenting, it might be suppressed. But I think it comes down to the final idea that many scientists themselves are the most, which is the idea of a new peace movement for science. And this is, it, it's very ironic that the Pagwash movement actually was supposed to start in India. In the last minute, it was hijacked by a Canadian industrialist and it moved to Pagwash in Nova Scotia. The idea now is. Can we now look for epistemologies of non-violence, epistemologies of non-endomate knowledge to create the possibility of a democratic science? I think what Isabel tried to emphasize, I'm trying to convert into a set of constitutional footnotes. The possibility is there. The invitation is exciting. It needs risk, both ethical and scientific. But I think that is the challenge of democracy. 
and democracy which dreams beyond electoralism and thinks of new ways of constructing knowledge. This is what I work on. Maybe a few years from now I can come back and report to you of the fate of these 